Hi, my name is Brian, and I'm the pastor of Vision at Holy City Church. I'm glad that you found our online sermon resources, and I pray that the Lord would use them to strengthen your faith. I would exhort you not to use our online sermon resources as a substitute for regular involvement in your own local church. That being said, I pray that our teaching resources would be helpful to you and conform you even more to the image of Christ. Okay, if everybody has the book of Judges in front of them, the big idea, Judges chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 2, that I want to get across to you, the big idea that I hope you'll grab, be able to hold on to leaving here, is that Israel fails to obey God, but God is faithful to his covenant with Israel. Let me say that again. Israel fails to obey God, but God is faithful to his covenant with Israel. Okay. So if you turn with me, looking at verse 1, I want to read those first three verses. We read there in Judges chapter 1, verse 1, After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, Who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me into the territory allotted to me that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I likewise will go with you into the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went with him. Judges begins with an assumption that you know who Joshua is and that you know what has gone on before. You're kind of getting in, if you're jumping into this, this story, you're jumping in at like season eight and a lot has gone on prior. And so what I want to do is one of those, one of those uh, summaries here, much like you might see at the first episode of a season that will say, so far in the story, this, that, the other happened. Now you can kind of be knowing what's going on from the get-go, okay? So let's, let's talk a bit about what has led us up to Judges chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, first off, the Bible begins teaching us that God created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. Are you with me so far, kids? Jud- Genesis 1, 1 says what? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We also learn in the first two chapters of Genesis that God made a man named Adam and a woman named Eve, and that, the th- that God, man and woman, and all of creation dwelled together in joyful relationship with one another. It's important that you and I remember, even though it's such a small segment of the scriptures and such a foreign experience to you and me, it's such an important thing to remember that there was a time when human experience was living in a garden that was marked by pure and unhindered joy. We all long for it. We all crave for it. It existed at one time. And the scriptures tell us so. That story doesn't last very long. That story survives to the end of Genesis chapter 2. And in Genesis chapter 3, the Bible then tells us that Satan deceived Eve into disobeying God's command. And that Adam chose to follow Eve instead of God's clear instruction. The sin... This sin caused God to punish Adam and Eve as he said he would. God was faithful to his promise, and he evicted humanity from the Garden of Eden. He set a curse upon all that he had made. Then in Genesis 12, we read about a man named Abram who had his name changed to Abraham. And that God approaches this idolater, and he makes a covenant with him. Part of God's gracious promise to Abraham was to bless him and to give him rest and a land to dwell in. This is particularly exciting when you think about how God had evicted humanity and how he's promising Adam a new home. Do you see that in Genesis 3 where he kicks him out of the garden and then he comes to to Abraham and says, I'm going to give you a new home. Do you feel how there's this sense of wandering and homelessness between the garden and between this new place that's promised to Abraham? Well, Abraham doesn't get it, but it's promised to him. Before the promise is fulfilled to Abraham, Abraham's descendants become slaves in Egypt. Kids, are you with me so far? You remember this part where where the Israelites are slaves in Egypt? Egypt. 
and how God sends a man named Moses to lead these people out of Egypt, out of slavery, and where? Into a promised land. Moses sends out 12 spies. Once they get to the edge of the promised land, they've left Egypt, they've They've gone a journey and a lot has happened there. They've come to the border. They've come to the front door of the promised land and Moses sends out 12 spies. 10 of those those spies come back from seeing the land. These are faithless and frightened men who see great big cities and gigantic human beings living in those great big cities. But there are two spies who see all of this with the eyes of faith. Their names are Joshua, you know the other one, Caleb. These spies see the giant people, they see the giant cities, but they also see the giant fruit, and they see the great land that God has promised to them, and their faith in God's promise is greater than their fears and the impossibility of what it seems to take over this land. Israel as a whole chooses to follow the fear-driven report of the faithless spies and God sends the nation into homeless wandering until that unbelieving generation died. Joshua and Caleb's faith was rewarded and they escaped this judgment and got to see and enjoy the land, also known as Canaan. Joshua led the nation into an initial conquest and possession of the land with miraculous victories. You guys know the first victory they had in Canaan? Jericho, right? Anybody know that old song? Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. That was a miraculous victory done by the power of God because walls don't fall down when people march around them seven days in a row and holler really loud, right? If they fall down, you better call your builder and get a refund, right? That is not the way things work, but that is the way things work if God promises to give you something. The book of Judges begins with the death of this great leader, Joshua. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, and now Judges begins after the death of Joshua. God still has a plan, still has a promise he's keeping to Israel that doesn't end when Joshua ends. And we need to remember this process of redemption that's unfolding book by book, chapter by chapter, as we come into the book of Judges. So much has happened already, and Israel has still not come into the promised land fully. Now, for us to understand what happens, I want to jump into the in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 7, okay? There's a lengthy section I want to read here because it's, it's God's command, God's instruction. This is how you take the promised land. I've promised it to you, and these are the instructions of how you take it, how you get it, okay? Are you with me? I need a drink. Anybody else need a drink? I just summarized like 200 or more pages of the Bible, uh, pushing 400 in mine. All right, Deuteronomy 7, starting at verse 1, says this. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, including the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. Who are those again? Uh, Read it for yourself. (laughs) Seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must, what must they do? Devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them. Show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. Why? Why would God say this? For they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you, and he would destroy you quickly. That's a motivation. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall break down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars, and chop down their asherim and burn their carved images with fire. Why? Why? 
For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God and the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repays to their face those who hate him by destroying them. He will not be slack with one who hates him. He will repay him to his face. You shall therefore be careful to do the commandment and the statutes and the rules that I command you today. Okay, so as we go through the book of Judges, I need you to hold firmly that God is a God who shows love. And yet he is a God who punishes those who hate him. Do you see how that's the whole counsel of God, we need to hold both of those things together at the same time. God has said he's a God of love and mercy and compassion. And yet he's a God who punishes and destroys those who hate him. And because God has lovingly and graciously chosen Israel, he's called them to destroy everything that is marked by hatred for God. He said, don't mix with it, don't compromise with it, don't make covenants, don't marry with them. Destroy everything. Now, this might strike you as a little odd, right? Because it sounds like in this passage, God sounds like the teacher and the karate kid for the Cobra Kai, and he says, no mercy. This doesn't sound like the God I know, but, but this, this, this is from Scripture. This is God speaking for himself. And this is going to be, this is a tricky topic, and this is going to be repeated over and over and over, so we're going to keep coming back to this. But as we summarize this and move into Judges, I want you to see that God has punished a sinful humanity who's rebelled against him. And yet at the same time, he's chosen a people to show mercy to. And the people that he's shown mercy to, he's protecting them from those who would lead them away from God. This has been a bumpy process, but God has been faithful and is now calling Israel to drive out nations and cultures and pagan worship practices of the people that are living in the promised land. Okay? All right. That's how we got to Judges chapter 1, verse 1. Are you still with me? Able to nod your head? You're doing okay? Whoa, Drew, that was a lot. Can we take a breath? Okay. I want you to know what's going on. I want you to know what the book of Judges is built upon. And so hopefully you understand what's going on. If you didn't understand what that Deuteronomy 7 was teaching and what God had taught there, it wouldn't make sense, even what we get into here in this first chapter. Okay? Now I want to look at, starting in verse 4, and I'm just going to kind of summarize whole paragraphs here of this first chapter, okay? In verses 4 through 7, Judah does what they set out to do. They went out and they defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Kids, can you say Perizzites? Holly, do you know how to say Perizzites? Perizzites. All right. Okay, so among these Perizzites, we read in verse 6 that they captured the king known as Adonai Bezek. And what did they do to him in verse 6? It says, they cut off his thumbs and his big toes. Rub your eyes. It really does say that. Okay, and this is why I want to go slow and I want to give room for you guys to ask questions as I'm able. The presence of killing and maiming like this is present all throughout the book of Judges. Okay, this is a small instance of some of the gnarly stuff we're going to see in this book. Okay, and it's important for us to understand what's going on because it doesn't seem like God would call somebody to chop off thumbs and toes, does it? That seems messed up. But in verse 7, we get a helpful explanation of why this killing and this maiming is going on. We read there that King Bezek, after losing his thumbs and big toes, says he's already done the exact same thing to 70 other kings who used to be in his home and in his house 
palace. And Bezek says, quote, God is repaying me. It may seem cruel and unusual for God to command the complete destruction of the Canaanites. But Adonai Bezek helps us to see that the Canaanites were not, Canaanites were not kind, sinless, and God-fearing people. They were wicked people who hated God, and just as God destroyed people like this with the flood, God destroyed people like this in Sodom and Gomorrah, God wiped out so many in Egypt with rolling back the Red Sea, Israel is God's expression of judgment to destroy and punish guilty sinners. Okay. It seems rough, it seems scary that God would say, kill everything. But if the wages of sin is death, and God decides your debt is due, then God is perfectly right and just to do it. And if God uses sulfur and fire from the sky to wipe out an entire city, or if God folds an entire army under the water with a sea, or if God floods the entire world with a flood, God is right to do that. Okay, and so while this is, has its own nuances and tweaks, and we need to be careful to, to understand, don't miss Adonai Bezek's confession, God is repaying me for sins I've already committed. Okay. Verses 8 through 10 We've got another victory. Judah goes in and destroys the Canaanites in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, verses 11 through 15, uh, we get a little cameo, a uh, little reminder of this great spy, this great man of faith, Caleb. Um, he was the other faith-filled spy, and we see that he's still here in the land. He's still alive after Joshua, and he's still believing God's promises that God is going to give them a land and God's going to give them a home and a place to rest. We also see here Caleb's daughter and a young man by the name of Othniel. Othniel we'll hear more about in chapter 3, so I won't spend much time talking about him here, but we'll talk about him in a few weeks. We learn that from this little brief snippet of Caleb and his his children, that God has sustained the faith of Caleb and there's still believers in Israel and that that faith of Caleb has been passed down to the next generation and so that the children of Caleb, that there is this handing off of believing God and of faith and it's not all bad. In verses 16 through 21, we see the obedience of Israel as Canaanites are being devoted to destruction. Israel is obeying what God has called them to do in Deuteronomy 7, and they're devoting to destruction everything that they see. We even see Caleb getting his promised inheritance with a victory over three sons of Anak in verse 20. Do you see that? This is one of those references where you really get paid off if you've been paying attention to reading through some of those difficult sections of like numbers. Because in Numbers 13, verses 32 and 33, there's a reference to Anak. When the spies go into the land, they'll say, hey, this is what we saw over there, and this is what's frightening to us. We read in Numbers 13, the spies said, all the people that we saw in, in that land are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who came from the Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. And so verse 20 just says, they defeated the sons of Anak. And you're not going to get all of what's being said in that if you don't remember what's already been said about the sons of Anak. The descendants of Anak are giants. Okay, Anak was an ancestor a great, great something or other of Goliath. So when David defeats Goliath, the great giant, back in his Ancestry.com profile, you're going to find Anak. Okay? And I'm not going to get into all the nitty-gritty about what the Nephilim are, but let me just what surmise what we see here basically is that there are human beings that if you look at them, make you feel like a bug. Okay? I don't need to know the height, weight, and ground speed, but if that person makes me feel like a grasshopper, I don't want to tangle with them. 
You with me? But it says right here that Caleb's faith in God, Caleb's obedience to God's promise, and Israel's obedience to this conquest meant they had victory over these sons of Anak. This is a miraculous underdog event. These victories are wonderful, but in verse 19, the good that's been developing here begins to unravel. We read there in verse 19 that Israel could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. Okay. There's a part of us that reads that and we think, oh yeah, we're just a bunch of guys on foot and these guys show up and they've got machine guns or they've got chariots. They're just going to mow us down. Yeah, let's just leave them alone. That seems wise and good. But when you understand that they've already killed families of giants, that excuse doesn't seem to hold water, does it? David and Goliath, in a manner of speaking, has happened numerous times where God has given them victory over Jericho. God has given them victory over giants. And now they, they make an excuse and they say, those guys have chariots. We can't do that. It doesn't fit. Are you with me? Do you see that? It doesn't seem to be at this season that there is an excusable retreat. God says, go no matter what you find and I'll give you victory. But they see something that they think they can't beat and their faithlessness, their failure to believe that God can give them victory even over chariots causes them to disobey. Do you see how the good is starting to unravel here? Ever so slightly. Verses 22 through 26 tell us that the house of Joseph, now it's not the house of Judah anymore, but the house of Joseph went up against Bethel and got a victory over it by promising to show mercy to a man who showed them the city's weakness. Though it's chalked up as a victory, it's bad because it is a win by their own wisdom and not according to God's promise, not according to God's will. He said, don't go into that land and make promises with people. Don't make bargains. Don't make deals. Don't show mercy. And what do they do? They say, we're going to show you mercy if you show us how to get in the back door. And that's exactly what Israel does. But it's clear that they are leaning on their own understanding. They're leaning on their own wisdom. They're relying in their own strength and their own cunning to get a victory. And they're not relying on the God who brought the walls of Jericho down. Israel's beginning to disobey. And in verses 26 through 27 through 36, we see that the good has moved from bad, and now it's getting ugly. Israel fails to defeat the enemies of God initially because they don't think they're strong enough. And then as time goes on, they enslave the peoples. And then... They not only enslave them, some places they just move in next door. Do you know what it requires to defeat an enemy? It requires strength. Do you know what is required to enslave a people? It requires strength. It's not that they didn't have what was necessary. They misused the strength and misused the power that God was giving them. And they used it to make their lives easier. Man, killing all, those, all that stuff and burning all those cities, that seems to be just a waste. What if we made those people cut our grass? What if we made those people do our work? Our lives could be a lot easier, and that seems to be efficient. That seems to be a good use of resources. Why don't we just move into these cities instead of killing all these people? But the problem with that while it may make a little sense and it may seem a little bit like they're using their noggins and they're, they're being resourceful and they're being wise, what's clearly wrong with it? It's obvious disobedience. God said, show no mercy. What's hard to understand about that? Wipe out, kill, destroy, burn, tear down everything. So often with God's promises and God's commands, it's not that they're hard to understand. It's just hard to obey. 
Now, what we're going to see in the book of Judges is a spiral, okay? Sometimes it's referred to in literature as a cycle, the cycle of Judges, but I want to tweak that just ever so slightly with you and kind of put it on its side and show you that it's a spiral, that there's a turning, there's a season, a secular pattern that goes on in this book, but it's turned on its edge such that things are moving in a direction. Let I want to give you a guess. What direction do you think they're moving in? They're not getting better. And we see that right away here in chapter 1, don't we? It starts out good. They're obeying God and they're having victory and they're doing it like God says. And then they make a little compromise. Hey, let's ask that guy how to get into this city. That'll make our lives easier, won't it? That'll make victory easier. We won't have to work so hard. We'll just show him some mercy. We'll make a little bit of compromise. We'll still do what God wants, but we'll just show mercy to that one guy. And then they make a little more compromise. Hey, we won't let these people live all in their own strength, all in their own power. We'll make them slaves. That's kind of what God said, right? Man, all this enslaving and all of this killing, it's hard. Let's just, let's just move in. We're, we're in the land. We're taking the promised land. This is good. We're just going to make promises. Do you see how there's this spiraling downward progression? moving further and further away from what God has commanded and what God has promised. Now, what all does this mean for us, right? Am I preparing you for a history exam? No. The scriptures are given to shape us, to make us the people like Jesus. And the important lesson that you and I need to learn from Israel is that they desired... They wanted the success that God had promised, and they experienced it as far as they obeyed him. Success is desirable, isn't it? Anybody got an amen in here? I want to be successful. But Israel failed when they gave way to fear of their opponent's strength. They failed when they leaned on their own wisdom instead of trusting to God to give what he had promised. You and I are like Israel when our desire to be successful causes us to be motivated by fear or causes us to be motivated by our own wisdom instead of obedience to God. I hope I'm not the only one in the room that needed to hear that this morning. We also need the reminder to obey God when our opponents seem too strong. Or we're convinced that there must be an easier way to get things done. I want to be a successful Christian. I want this to be a successful church. And if we lean on our own wisdom, instead of leaning on God's wisdom, if we begin to think that we can figure this thing out as the means of becoming successful, individually or as a church, this is where we get onto that downward spiral. But to be a successful Christian, to be a successful church, is to trust that God's going to keep his promises. And I'm going to obey him, no matter how scary it is. Kids, can I talk to you for a second? There's an advantage us older people have, is that we've, Some of us have obeyed God several times when we were just terrified and it worked out. And I need you to know that at some point you're going to be called to obey God and it's going to be scary. And I want you to trust him because we see right here in the Judges chapter one that either we choose to live by fear or we choose to live by faith. And when Israel chose to live by fear instead of faith, and obedience, things went badly. Things went badly. So even if it seems good, like good sense to not tell mom everything or to sin just a little bit, you're getting on a, on a bad trajectory and you're going to a place you really don't want to go. So I want to encourage each and every one of you to trust God even when it's scary. Obedience to God is the best thing you and I can do. Success comes from trusting God and obeying his word. We've seen so far that Israel's faith in God was true. And when 
It was true, things went well. But where they doubted him, where they feared their enemies, they leaned on their own wisdom. The results went from bad to worse. And I want to look now at how God responded to these people. Israel fails God, but God is faithful to his covenant to Israel. Turn with me to chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. We read there, Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? This downward spiral, this faithlessness, this disobedience continues, and God sends a messenger to confront them. And for many of you who know your Bibles well, an encouragement to those of you who don't know your Bibles well to read it, is that this sounds an awful lot like Genesis 3, doesn't it? This question of God, what have you done? God approaches his people and he holds them accountable for their actions. He reminds them of what he's done in delivering them, of providing them goodness and getting them out of slavery, making a covenant with them that he has sworn that he will never break. And then he reveals to them, but you've severely broken our covenant. I will never break it, but you've broken it over and over and over again. Look now at verse 3. The messenger of God continues to speak for God and says, So now I say I will not drive them out, the Canaanites, from before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. To hear the echoes of Genesis 3 again, talking about thorns, talking about traps, talking about difficulties. God punishes his people for their sins, for their their unfaithfulness. It's a clear reminder to us that God hasn't changed from Genesis 1 to Judges 1. God is still the same God who confronts his people when they sin. And he's still the same God who punishes them for their sins. God is still righteous, and humanity is still breaking commandments and getting into trouble. And so I hope that you can see quite clearly that what's true from Genesis 1 to Judges 2 is still true for us today, that God is still faithful. God is still just. God is still keeping his covenant, and humanity is still caught in this cycle of obedience and disobedience, of breaking God's covenant and sinning against him then look at verses four and five we read there as soon as the angel of the lord spoke these words to all the people of israel the people lifted up their voices and wept and they called the name of that place bokim and they sacrificed there to the lord we see israel's sadness and grief as they begin to wrestle with the consequences of their sin They're wrestling with their failure to obey and the weightiness of it. They weren't aware until God approached them and told them what they had done. But now they are dealing with the consequences of their sin. And they aren't laughing. This isn't a funny moment. This isn't a party. This isn't joy. There's there's sadness. There's grief when they realized the weight and the punishment for their sin. Not only do they weep, but what do they do there in verse 5? It says they sacrificed there to the Lord. They knew that their sin required death. And what had God given them as a reminder that God would provide a way to overcome their sin, to pay their debt, was the sacrificial system. So the shedding of blood was something that was done to show that sin is real and sin requires death. And God doesn't just brush sins under the rug. But a sacrifice needs to be made so that sins can be atoned for. Now what all does this mean for us? Again, this isn't a 
I'm not prepping you for some history exam. How does this, this scripture shape your life? What does this mean for me? Okay. So much of how the book of Judges teaches us and shapes us is it teaches us not by necessarily uh, putting things on a platter for us, but it presents us with a void. It presents us with an absence. It presents us with a chair with nobody sitting in it, and it seems like that's not right. Something's missing here. And you're going to see that so often in the Old Testament, but maybe almost the most clear in the book of Judges. that This isn't right. We need something, and that something isn't here. Right? So the book of Judges prepares us for something or someone that is desperately needed. Humanity is so broken, and you see that so clearly in the book of Judges, that a mutually dependent partnership between man and God isn't going to work out. Right? Do you see that super clearly in this passage? Right? God says, I'm going to give you the land. I'm going to help you. All you got to do is just go there and fight them. So we'll go together and we'll win this victory together and together we're going to have a promised land. You're going to have rest. It's going to be good. It's like you're going to get back in the garden. But that kind of partnership doesn't work. Why? Because God is unfaithful? No. Because humanity is so broken and so unreliable. This is about you. This is about me. That if God were to slightly lean on us to move forward, we wouldn't get anywhere. God is the only faithful. God is the only reliable one in this passage, in the book. Right? So there's a sense of discouragement. Wow, humanity isn't as awesome as I had hoped. Right? And some of you are putting your hope that someday humanity is going to get all of our social troubles figured out. But let me tell you, it's not going to happen. All of history is proclaiming the truth that humanity is not reliable and salvation will never come from any person or any group of people. But only God is reliable. The void that we're seeing in Judges chapter 1 is that we need a Savior. We need a God and the way this situation is going isn't going to work. We're not going to get our home. We're not going to get the promised land. We're not going to find the rest because we keep screwing it up. What's God going to do? You guys know that old, that old idiom, that old phrase, you can't lead a horse to water, right? Do you know how the rest of it goes? You can lead a horse to water, excuse me, but you can't make him drink, right? The ever optimist says, have you tried feeding him salt, right? So, there's a sense where Judges sort of creates this thirst. It creates this need. It creates this sense of suspense of like, what's God going to do? Because God said he's going to lead them into the promised land, and he brought them in, and he gave them all the success in the world, and they screwed it up. There's a sense of saltiness of like, I need living water. I need God to do something. Where is this redeemer? Where is this salvation? How is this going to happen? Because obviously the Israelites can't be depended upon. How is God going to give what he's promised? This sacrifice in verse 5 is also an important cue to us. Because as the New Testament shows us, the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, whenever you see an animal going on an altar, it should point us to Christ. It should point us to the cross. As Ephesians 5, 2 says, Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Sinners brought a sacrifice in hopes that God would look upon it, pour out his wrath upon that sacrifice instead of them. That was a hopeless thing, but it was an excellent pointer to how you and I are supposed to look at Christ. God, I've sinned against you. You've confronted me. You've shown my sinfulness. My only hope is that you would pour out your wrath on a perfect sacrifice instead of me. And that's what we see at the cross. That's what we see at Jesus. We see God putting his, his life down. Jesus putting his life down as a sacrifice so that you and I could be forgiven. Israel put their hope in a lamb or they put their, self, their hope in a bull and, and that God would receive that sacrifice as just payment for their sin. But you and I, 
as sinners before God. Our only hope and our perfect hope is that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. Coming to us, weak and unable people, and making it so that we can, can have the hope of an eternal home with Christ. The last application I want to put here together is while we rejoice that God forgives because of Christ, that God atones for my sin, my failure, my inability to always obey, he atones for me through Christ, his body broken and his blood shed. But the thing we also need to remember in the, at the same time is that God disciplines his sons. God doesn't just put our sins on Jesus and say, hey, let's just pretend that never happened. Hebrews 12 tells us, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. As the messenger of God approached and confronted Israel because of their sinfulness, the same is true for you and me. If you're a child of God, if you're a Christian, know that your struggle with sin is not overlooked by God, but that God in his love and his faithfulness to his covenant with you, God comes to us and he disciplines us. Not with the kind of discipline that says, go to your room, I can't stand to look at you. That's not the discipline of God. But the discipline of God comes and it often brings tears and it brings a brokenness just like it did at Bokim. Where the people say, we are sorry for sinning against you. And God leads us to that place. But let me encourage you, brothers and sisters, that's the best thing God could do for you. Caught in your sin is to not ignore you. There is a burden. There is a difficulty. There is a weariness that comes when God disciplines our sin. Oh, God. I'm so tired of, of you showing me my sin and of you catching me in my sin, I just, this is hard. But the alternative is God saying, forget you, do whatever you want. That's the wrath of God. But God in his love for you points out your sin and makes you uncomfortable in it and leads you into paths of righteousness for his name's sake. God chose the nation of Israel to receive his gracious and undeserved love. He commissioned them to serve and obey him as his children, but they chose to rebel and do their own thing and to do it in their own way. Like Israel, each and every one of us has sinfully rebelled against God. And each of us needs the salvation that only God can provide through faith that turns from sin and trusts in Jesus. Those who found their hope in Christ need to remember that God still confronts us, still confronts the Christian in his sin. He disciplines us so that we might walk closer with him. Let's pray.